I'm going to talk today about uh, percolation on, on uh, sort of big transitive graphs. And this is something that uh, Russ has been, you know, very involved from very early on, uh, really building up this, this really nice theory. And uh, I want to start by talking about some of kind of the history of the problem. We'll see all of these, like, amazing papers that Russ wrote with uh, Yuval and Itai and Oded back in the back in the 90s, and then I'll move on to some new stuff. Okay. So let's uh, start by just setting up some basic notions. So I'm going to be talking about percolation. So I think, you know, everyone probably knows what this is, but just so we have notation, uh, I'm going to have a graph G, and I'll delete or retain each edge independently with retention probability P to get this graph that I'll denote by G with these uh, closed brackets P. Okay, and we have the critical probability of G is just the, the smallest value of P, where for larger values, you see an infinite cluster almost surely. Okay, and you know, the first thing that we know about percolation is on most transitive graphs, actually this is, uh, so, so on most transitive graphs, there is a phase transition. So PC is strictly between zero and one. And the only case where we expect this not to be true is for things that look one dimensional. But actually, it's open for groups of intermediate growth still in general, but that's sort of the only thing where it's open. Okay, and what do I mean by a transitive graph? I just mean a graph where for any two vertices, there's an automorphism of the graph, which just means a symmetry. So it's a bijection from the vertex set that preserves the adjacency relation. It sends one vertex to the other. So every vertex looks the same. Okay, and the, the sort of two big main questions in percolation are firstly, what is the nature of this phase transition? So is there an infinite cluster at PC or not? And what are the critical exponents and so on? And then another big question is you say, let's look at supercritical percolation. I want to know, is there just one infinite cluster or is there more than one? Okay, so if we look at this uniqueness problem, we want to define now an another phase transition, the uniqueness threshold which is now the smallest value of P, such that for some larger value of P, there's a unique infinite cluster. Now, it's not clear that this is really the right definition because it could be as you increase P, you sort of swap back and forth between having one infinite cluster and infinitely many. It's not a monotone event, so it's not, this is not obvious at all. Okay, but just some basic results here is that for any transitive graph, we have to either have one infinite cluster or zero infinite clusters if it's subcritical or infinitely many. You can't have like five. Okay, and in ZD, it's been known since, you know, way back that there has to be a unique infinite cluster whenever you're supercritical. So this was first shown by Eisenman, Keston, and Newman. And then there was a very nice proof by Burton and Keane a little bit later, which uh, generalizes better. So it it's, will be important to us. Okay, so... In fact, this proof that was given by Burton and Keane generalizes to any amenable transitive graph. So what does this mean? So a graph is non-amenable if there's some universal positive constant so that if you take any finite set in the graph, then the number of edges in the boundary of the set divided by the number of points in the set is at least that constant. So it's sort of the version of being an expander, but for infinite graphs. Okay, and what, they sh what Burton and Keane showed, or Rather, they did things in ZD, but, it, but it's not too hard to see that their proof also generalizes here. So whenever you have amenability, you have uniqueness of the infinite cluster. And what Itai and Oded conjectured, and this is still very much open, is that actually the converse of the burton keane theorem is also true. So they conjectured that whenever you have a transitive non-amenable graph, there are some values of P where you get infinitely many infinite clusters. Okay, um, and so for some graphs, this is really obvious. I mean, if you take the uh, three regular tree on the right here, you can easily see that PU has to be one because, you know, if whenever I have an edge, if, you know, if this edge is not here, which happens with positive probability, and I'm super critical, then I can have a cluster on either side. So it's very easy to see for the tree that PU is equal to one and therefore PC is less than PU. But, you know, even, so here's a graph where we do know it. This is sort of a planar hyperbolic lattice. It's not so easy. I mean, it, 
it actually still is pretty easy in this example, but you can see it's not completely obvious, at least. And for many graphs, we have you know, absolutely no idea how to prove it. So uh, I have these custom uh, Rust uh, things to uh, highlight the papers Rust has been involved in. So let me give you a, uh, a little quick timeline of some of the main results on the sort of percolation on big transitive graphs. So I think sort of arguably the first result that was the first paper that really looked specifically in this setting. So there are many earlier papers that apply to sort of general transitive graphs, uh, sort of all these uh, differential inequalities and things that uh, Mike Leisman was talking about yesterday. But I think the first sort of significant paper specifically about percolation in a non-amenable setting and not just on a tree was by Grimmett and Newman in 1919. I'll have more to say about this later. Yeah, and then in 1995, we had a very nice paper by Russ where he was looking at percolation on trees, actually, but he found as a corollary that he could show that PC is less than one for any transitive graph of exponential growth. But things really got moving a lot faster following, I, I think it's fair to say, following these two papers. So firstly, it's this paper by Atai and Oded in 1996 called uh, Percolation Beyond ZD, Many Questions and a Few Answers. And it's sort of less of a paper and more of a mission statement, I think. So it really, you know, they had a lot of really nice questions, including that conjecture, many other very nice conjectures, most of which are still open. And it really injected a lot of uh, life into this, into this field. And then secondly, in 1997, uh, Hagstrom, uh, which whose name I'm probably not pronouncing correctly, introduced what's called the mass transport principle. And this turned out to be hugely helpful. So I guess following these two papers, we had sort of the um, uh, motive and opportunity, which, of course, you need for any crime. And not only did we have uh, motive and opportunity, but we had the, the perfect uh, fortet of uh, able criminals. And <laughs> well, it depends. <laughs> so this led to a huge flurry of progress. And in fact, it seems like almost all of this progress occurred in one year, or at least the papers were published in one year, in 1999. So we had a series of really nice papers, so several of which uh, were Russ's involved in. And for me personally, I think that my, some of my favorite papers by Russ. Um, so let me just go through. Uh, I'm not sure where the order comes from here. But so in 1999, uh, Babson and Benjamini gave a, proved that PU is less than 1 for Cayley graphs of, of one-ended finitely generated groups. So this is sort of coming from the other side. You know, when is PU less than 1? So this is really nice. And then uh, this uh, BLPS starts, uh, studied sort of general invariant percolation. So not necessarily Bernoulli. You just assume you, know, you have a random subgraph that's, that's uh, distribution is invariant under the symmetries of the graph. And you know, they, 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 this was, they really uh, developed how you can use the mass transport principle, found many new uh, ways of using it. And this, all this was going on at the same time as their work on uniform spanning forests, where this was really getting developed a lot as well. And in particular, they found, basically through this very soft study of general percolation processes, they found this really nice proof, also published in 99, that whenever you have a, non, a unimodular non-amenable graph, transitive graph, then there is no percolation at PC. And I, this might be uh, my favorite paper by Russ, except this indistinguishability paper is also up there. It would be hard to choose. And they're indistinguishable? They are indistinguishable in, the, in their high quality. Um, OK, and uh, also in the same year, there was a paper by Hagstrom, Perez, and Schonman who showed that this PU transition, it really is a transition. So there's some number where when you're, if you're between PC and PU, you have infinitely many infinite clusters. And if you're above PU, you always have a unique one. There's no oscillation between the two behaviors. And you would expand what is indistinguishability? No, because it would take, take a whole talk, I think. Well, <laughs> not quite, but. <laughs> Yeah, but this is a really nice paper. Uh, if you read it, then you'll understand what indistinguishability is, and you'll learn a lot besides. 
and uh, to celebrate <laughs> how much they got done in this year. You know, this was really a golden age for the subject, and I, I wanted to commemorate that with, uh, by comparing them to the uh, golden age of uh, classical antiquity. <laughs> and uh, just, um, you know, this is, yeah, this is the tie. It's not supposed to be him, that is his face. <laughs> and, and, uh, moreover, just to convince you that I spent the time on the most important things when I was preparing this talk, I just want to point out that Russ, as Plato there, is actually holding a copy of Probability on Trees and Networks. <laughs> the beginning. <laughs> yeah, that's how long it took to write. Okay, so let's go back to this um, uh, PC versus PU conjecture. So most, so the, there's been several sort of partial results. So these kind of fall into two categories. So the first one that are on this slide are what I call perturbative results. So here the idea is you get some kind of combinatorial bounds on PC and PU, and you show that for certain graphs where some parameters are large or small, that you can just separate PC and PU via these kind of combinatorial bounds. So, so there are a bunch of results to this effect. So uh, Schonman uh, showed it for grass with large Chiga constants, Pack and uh, Smanova Nagnabeda, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, showed it for uh, grass with small spectral radius and, and showed that this implies that every Cayley graph, every group, has a Cayley graph where PC is less than PU. And then there's this nice criterion by uh, Asaf and Yuval with, with this thing. Uh, and, and they showed that, in particular, if you have a non-amenable Cayley graph with large girth, then it has to have PC less than PU. Yeah. But these things are nice, and they tend to give you really strong results as well when you, when you can apply them. So also mean field exponents and so on. But um, then it's sort of not expected that you could handle the general conjecture. I mean, you could keep pushing and pushing these perturbative methods, but you know, you'd have to push infinitely far to be able to handle the, uh, the general thing. Okay, so some non-perturbative results. Well, firstly, so here I mean, you know, use some sort of symmetry property or something of the graph to, to, uh, to handle it. So first of all, it's trivial for infinitely ended groups, like a tree, where you have these finite cuts that separate you into multiple infinite connected components. Trivial is one of the most accomplished authors. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, and then Italian Oded showed that it's true for transitive planar graphs. Okay, and then, uh, uh, okay, so this, this isn't really a, a theorem about it holding, but Lyons, Perez, and Schramm showed that PC less than PU, it's equivalent to a, to a question about minimal spanning forests. And then this was used in sort of various papers by Gaboriel and Lyons uh, over the two, early 2000s uh, to show that for any transitive graph admitting a non-constant harmonic Dirichlet function has to have PC less than PU. Okay, and this class is, is closed under sort of perturbations and this is really the only case where we have uh, a condition that says, uh, you know, every Cayley graph of a group has PC less than PU if it has this thing. Well, but do you know any example where this is the only way we know to prove that, right? So, no. No? No. It's a bigger class. Conjecture, conjecturally equal, right? Well, yeah, okay. True. Okay. So the result that I want to talk to you about today, except actually I'm really going to talk to you about a very special subcase that I can give a nice short proof for, is this theorem, um, which is that if you have a transitive graph and the automorphism group has a transitive non-unimodular subgroup, um, then you get this separation of PC and PU. So I haven't told you what this means yet, but I'm going to tell you about a very specific example, and I'll say exactly what it means in that example. Okay, and also our proof gives you a lot more sort of stuff for free. 
So it also tells you that the triangle condition is satisfied at PC, which gives you all mean field behavior for percolation. And uh, the techniques that uh, were developed for this, it seems like you can probably handle a lot of other models beside percolation. I mean, you have to you know, get into that model and, and work with it. But for example, so I've been able to analyze self-avoiding walk using similar techniques. And probably you could do like e-sync, things like that. I, I haven't really tried. OK. So a really nice uh, example that this allows us to clear up is, is actually the first example that was studied by uh, Grimmett and Newman back in 1990. So what they looked at is the product of a tree with z, with the, with the integers. Right? And they actually looked at anisotropic percolation. So they said, look at tree times z. Imagine you give a different openness retention probability for the z edges than the tree edges. And <coughs> so they looked at the, sort of the phase diagram of this. And what they believed is always true is this picture on the left. This is just a topological picture. I'm not claiming anything about the shape of the curves, which is just that, OK, so this white area is the subcritical area. The gray area is the infinite unique infinite cluster area. And this blue area is the infinitely many infinite clusters. So they conjectured that you all, this, this blue region really s separates the white region from the gray region. So even if you go up like this way and you make the z edges very strong and then you just tip yourself over into the supercritical region this way, no matter how you do it, you always have to go through this non-uniqueness region. And this in particular would imply PC less than PU because you just take the diagonal line up through the center. And they were actually able to prove that this picture was correct when the tree has large degree. But in general, for low degree trees, they could only sort of study this bit near this axis where the z edges are mostly closed and uh, just go along here. But even here, there are some interesting things. So for example, they showed that if, if you start by having the tree edges are open anywhere above this threshold, then any epsilon density of z edges you add will make it connected, will make the infinite cluster unique. So even there, even in this perturbative regime, there's some interesting stuff going on. And I should say, specifically for this example, there's, for, if you just want to go along the, this diagonal and prove PC less than PU, it actually was only open when the tree has degree three. So the, the perturbative methods have been pushed so far in this recent paper of Yamasaki, pushed it down to the tree having degree four, only three was really open. OK, so it turns out tree times z it has one of these non-unimodular subgroups of automorphisms. In fact, it's just the group that fixes a specified end of the tree. So using, uh, using my methods, um, I'm able to complete this, this picture. So show that this is really the phase diagram always. So you, you handle the anisotropic? Yeah. It's just because it's not perturbative, it just doesn't really matter. I mean, it's. It's not, not different. Um, and similarly, they also looked at tree times ZD. Again, they conjectured that this is the phase diagram. So obviously, so once you're above PC of ZD, you have a unique thing. But they, they were not able to verify this for, for any degree of the tree, this whole phase diagram. But again, this, this has one of these groups. So, uh, so it follows fr from my work that this really is the, the phase diagram on the left. OK. But what I want to talk to you about for the rest of today is not this, because the proof is not elegant. But, <laughs> but I want to instead tell you some very nice, easy proofs. Uh, so one is something from last year um, that I proved, which is that any transitive graph of exponential growth has no infinite clusters at PC. And then the second one is actually sort of recovering something Gaddy did. So it's showing that if you have a product of trees, then PC is less than PU, and you, and you get triangle condition, and so on. OK. Both of these are special cases? The first one is, is needed, actually, because we need to know that PC that there's no percolation at PC on these graphs to, but it's not a special case, it's just a different thing. This second one is a special case, 
but it's a very special case. I mean, it's really much easier. Although Gaddy still had to work quite hard, but that, you know, we've we've moved on. Now we have <laughs> we have uh, uh, nice easy proofs. Okay, how much time do I have? Uh, Twenty-five minutes. Okay. Okay. So both these proofs are going to come down to sort of the same silly trick, which is basically it's that uh, Fekater's lemma, so this is the lemma about subadditive sequences, when you apply it in this setting of exponential growth, it's much more powerful than anyone noticed before. I mean, I, I really got very lucky with this paper last year, I realized that just using these extremely elementary methods, you get a bound that's actually very strong, and it al allows you to do everything. Okay, so let me start with the first theorem. Okay, so I'll define the exponential growth, growth rate of a graph. to be this, so I take a ball of radius r, I look at how many points are in it, I take the rth power, I take the, the limb sup of that. So this defines the rate of exponential growth of a graph. So a graph has exponential growth if this is strictly larger than one. Okay, and the theorem that I just advertised is that if g is transitive, <laughs> and has exponential growth, then there's no percolation at PC. OK, but turns out, based on things that we already know before, it suffices to prove, say, theorem prime, which is that there's no there cannot be a unique infinite cluster at PC. And why does theorem prime imply the theorem? Well, I already told you that uh, Burton Keane says that amenability implies uniqueness. So if we're looking at amenable graphs, they just cannot possibly have infinitely many clusters. So it certainly suffices to show that they don't have a unique infinite cluster at PC. And uh, BLPS tells us that uh, non-amenability they just already handled the case that's non-amenable unimodular. This is just done, so we don't need to worry about that. And then Adam Tima proved that in non-unimodular graphs, so you don't even need to know what these terms mean, you just need to sort of read the surface grammar of what I'm saying to understand that this is enough. Uh, He proved that for non-unimodular transitive graphs, there cannot be infinitely many infinite clusters at PC. So it's clear, even if, as long as you understand that unimodular is the opposite of non-unimodular amenable, the so opposite of non-amenable, <laughs> from this, this is enough to show that there can't be uh, a, uh, um, any infinite clusters at PC. Okay, and what I'm really going to prove is actually some a, a, a precise bound on the probability of two points being connected. 
So what I'm going to define, so I'm, I'm going to fix some graph here and define kappa p n is going to be the infimum of the probability at p times switch friends. It's not that bad. <laughs> well, I guess I'm a lot closer. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. So I'm going to look at the infimum of connection probabilities over points whose distance is at most n. The whole thing in blue? I only see just blue uh, okay. Okay, so it's just I look at all points of distance at most n, and I look at the infimum of the connection probabilities. And what I'm going to prove is that. At PC, kappa P of N, kappa PC of N is always bounded by the growth of G to the power negative N. Okay, and once you have this, this theorem prime follows immediately. So why is that? It's because suppose I have a unique infinite cluster at PC, then I can always bound the probability that x is connected to y by the probability that x is connected to infinity times the probability that y is connected to infinity. So this is by the uh, FKG inequality. I mean, these are certainly true. If x and y are both connected to infinity, there's a unique infinite cluster, then they have to be connected to each other. But these are increasing events, so they're positively correlated. Right, so if you have a unique infinite cluster, this connection probability has to be bounded below. But this says that it's decaying, so, so there can't be one. OK, and the proof is going to use absolutely nothing at all. So it's just going to be, well, two things. It's going to be one theorem about percolation that's very classical, and another, and just an application of submultiplicativity. So, so what is Fekater's lemma? Well, here's, here's, the, here's the version of it that I'll actually use. So suppose AN is a sequence of positive numbers and they satisfy this relation. So a n plus m is at least the product of a n and a m. So this is called the supermultiplicative sequence. Okay. Then what the lemma tells you is that, firstly, this limit exists. And you actually get a bound of a n is at most this limit. To the power n. Okay, and you know, if, uh, I, I imagine most of you have seen this before, but if you haven't, you'll be able to prove this in, you know, a couple minutes if you try. Okay, so really, what this, what one thing this tells us is when we have a sequence like this, a supermultiplicative sequence, and suppose we have a bound, like, uh, suppose we have a bound like a n is at most a constant times some number to the power n then what it tells us, if we have this bound, actually we can remove the constant. And this is actually very powerful. Um, so how are we going to apply this in percolation? Well, what we'll do is we'll use the theorem of Eisenman and Bosky from the 80s.
and this has this nice new proof due to uh, Vincent and Hugo. So it says that if P is less than PC, then the expected cluster size is finite. So this is in any transitive graph. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to say that when P is less than PC, we get a bound like this, but with, uh, I'm going to call this the susceptibility, chi P, but with chi P is a constant out front. But then this just lets us kill it, and then we just get a uniform bound that holds for all P less than PC, and therefore also holds at PC. So, uh, so first of all, we have to notice that this sequence kappa p of n is supermultiplicative. So why is that? It's just, well, if I have two vertices at distance n plus m, right, then I can find a vertex on the path between them so that this is at most n and this is at most m. And then I get that the probability that u is connected to v by positive association of increasing events, the FKG inequality, that this is at least the probability that u is connected to w and w is connected to v. Right? And if you take the infimum, you just get the supermultiplicativity of this sequence. Okay. And now, well, let's suppose p is less than pc then I can bound, if I look at the volume of the ball of radius n times kappa p of n, right? Then this, this guy is a lower bound on the connection probabilities from x to everything in the ball around it. Right, so this is bounded by the sum of y and bn times the probability that x is connected to y. So all these balls are around x. OK, but this is just obviously bounded by the susceptibility, right? because it's just summing over a smaller thing. Right, so if I rearrange, yeah, because this, this is a lower bound on every term in the sum. Yeah. So I get that. Kappa P of N is bounded by chi P over the volume of the ball. Right, but then Fekater tells us that actually Kappa P of N is bounded by the limit of this. But this taking the limit just kills the susceptibility. So I get that it's bounded by, uh, and, the, and then the limit of this guy, it's, it's just the growth. OK, and you, know, you have this bound. It's the same bound holds uniformly for every p less than pc. So it has to also hold at pc. I mean, you know, there's a little, a little argument to do, but not, not really. So, that's the whole proof, basically. So using just this finiteness of the susceptibility and the Fekater's lemma, you know, we proved uh, that there's no population at PC. It's, uh, it's kind, of, kind of crazy. OK, and now what I want to tell you about, so how much time do I have? OK, so now I want to do with uh, exponential growth. Right, but, well, this bound is true without exponential growth. <laughs> I, I, I didn't use the fact that it had exponential growth. It's just that it's. Now, was it for the also the case, the other case, the I don't think so. <laughs> I thought about it a bit. Obviously, it would be very nice. 
but I, I, you know, these things are very particular. Even intermediate growth rate, like some stretched exponential growth, because that, that PC less than one is up. Oh, I should mention that this actually gives a new proof of Russ's result that PC is less than one for these graphs. Obviously, if you have no percolation at PC, you have to have PC less than one. Uh, well, actually, this bound already says PC less than one. So, uh -huh. not really. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, so now what I want to do is do exactly the same dumb trick and prove that the triangle condition holds on tree times tree. And the, the reason why this case is easy is because if you look at the probability for any p, so uh, the two vertices in the product of two trees are connected, then it only depends on the distance between the two coordinates in the first tree and the distance between the two coordinates, just because the, yeah? Yeah, okay, so let, uh, let me state the theorem in a, in a second. Yes, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll basically be able to prove everything that we want about percolation on, the, on this graph. Um, so, okay, so what's the theorem? Okay, so firstly, PC T times tree is less than PU tree times tree. Okay, that's the first thing. So this is actually a, a new thing. And then the second thing will recover what Gaddy did, which is that the triangle will get mean field exponents. So the way you get mean field exponents for percolation is you prove that the triangle condition is finite. So what's the triangle thing? It's triangle of P. It's I sum over all pairs Y and Z. I look at the probability that X is connected to Y, Y is connected to Z, and Z is connected back to X. Okay, so it was a theory, uh, I think this was first introduced by Eisenman and Newman, and then in subsequent works of uh, Eisenman and Barsky and uh, Nguyen and uh, Asaf and Gaddy, that um, once you have this, you can really do prove most things that you want to about, about uh, percolation at, at criticality, all these exponents. Okay, so this, this is what we'll prove is that this guy is finite at PC. Okay, so what we're going to do to prove this is to take the non-unimodular perspective on this graph. So what we'll do is for each of these two trees, we'll fix an end of the tree. So basically what this means is you draw the tree like this, where you have a kind of a height on the tree. So as you you can go up and down. Okay, and we do this for both trees. So we fix an orientation, basically. And what we'll define, so the, the really, the key definition is, well, first of all, we have the modular function, which is a general thing in non-union modular transitive graphs, but here it has a very specific, uh, description. So I'll assume both my trees are three regular trees, just for, they don't have to be, but this just will we'll, we'll 
simplify notation a bit. So that it's just going to be 2 to the power of the height difference of, of uh, y1 and x1 plus the same thing, but y2 and x2. Right, so really, it's like we have a function on each coordinate, and then we multiply them. Right, so for example, if in one tree, both if, if, if y is one step above x in both trees, then this will be 4. Okay, And we'll define this thing, which I call the tilted susceptibility. will sum over y. So it's like the susceptibility. We sum over connection probabilities. But we weight them by the modular function to, to a power lambda that we choose. It's like an extra parameter. And so the big story for the whole non-unimodular stuff is that these quantities, and you can define other things like a tilted version of the magnetization, all these sort of classic thermodynamic quantities from percolation, but you stick this modular function some power in, and they basically behave very similarly to the classical quantities, except the really the crucial thing is that you get a different critical value. And then, you know, once you have different critical values, PC less than PU, it's, you know, just follows. Um, and that, that's really the key thing. So, um, so one way in which these guys are very similar... Sorry, was it the lambda in your definition? Sorry? sorry? It's this power here, sorry. It's a bit it's small. Okay. Yeah, you take, take it to a power. So you, you imagine when lambda is large, you're very heavily weighting things that are high in the tree. When it's like negative, you're weighting things low in the tree. The so is always bigger than one. The height difference is, uh, is more negative. It's two to the power of the height difference. The height difference is starting after that. It's defined as one minus it's the Yeah, difference. right. Yeah, sorry. OK, so one way in which this is very similar to the classical guy is that it has to blow up at, if you look at the largest, the, the infimum of the values of p where it's infinite, then it is actually infinite at that infimum. Can I verify, this, is, this delta is not symmetric in epsilon? It, it, when you switch them, you, it, uh, you take the reciprocal. Um, so. If you define PC lambda to be the value where chi P lambda blows up, then it really is infinite at this value. It's not just that it's infinite at larger values. So that's one thing you can prove using differential inequalities exactly the same way as you would for the normal susceptibility. Okay, so in particular, this means the set where it's finite is open. So if we can prove that it's finite a PC for some lambda, then it has to still be finite when we go up, when we increase P a bit, and that means that we're still below PU, because if this is finite for any lambda, you certainly have decay of the connection probabilities. Okay. Um. It, uh, it, you, you can prove that it, um, there's a, I, I don't think I have time to get into this, but it, but it, the biggest value is always when lambda, the smallest value is when lambda is a half. So a half is special for, this, for these things. And in fact, if you look at PC lambda, what I expect is that it looks sort of like this, where the maximum is at a half. It certainly has to be the maximum at a half. Currently, I can't prove this. I can prove, gee, tree times tree, I can prove this. But in general, it might have a flat bit at the top of PC lambda, just to answer a, a SAS question. So for the general non-unimodular thing, I just have to prove that PC, which is here, at, here, this is PC, is smaller than PC 1 half. OK. So but as I said, for tree times tree, and I think I'm running out of time, but you can just use this sub-multiplicativity thing to directly calculate that chi PC of lambda 
is finite when, uh, when lambda is strictly between 0 and 1. Um, so, and as I say, once you prove this, you immediately get PC less than PU, but in fact, you also get the triangle condition because there's just a completely elementary bound which says that for any lambda, the triangle sum is bounded by chi p lambda cubed. Right? And why is this true? Well, you just expand this thing on the right, but you, you bound the triangle sum So in the definition, z, z was supposed to connect back to x, but I can bound it by letting z by summing over an additional thing and then putting this modular function of x, w here to the lambda. And this is trivially bound on the triangle sum because when you take w to equal x, you just get the triangle sum. So you're summing over more stuff. Okay, but then you can use the symmetry of the modular function, which is obvious in this specific case, which is that this is actually equal to this. Okay, so applying this function to x and w, I can split it up and apply it to each of these pairs sequentially. And when you use this identity, you put it into here, and you redistribute into the sum, you just get exactly chi p lambda cubed. Okay? Okay, so I think I... It's just one. Okay, so I think I've run out of time, but uh, you can prove that this is finite at PC on this graph just using factor and finite susceptibility here. Anyway. Thank you.